Got room for one more? Thanks for being here, both of you. So Jennifer, you've had six, by my count, nominations from the Spirit Awards over your career, amongst countless other nominations, but this is the first Academy Award nomination. What does that mean to you? Um, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, it doesn't get much bigger than that, you know? So, um, it, it also, I loved making this movie so very, very much, and it, in a way, it keeps the movie alive for me. Because when a movie comes out, there's always, if you love it, it almost feels like an end. Mm. And there's something bittersweet about it. You get to share it with the world and your friends and your family, but it's kind of over for you and the crew, you know? But this keeps it alive a little longer. So it's just, it's meaningful in so many ways. And that's just two of them. Bob, you've worked with Quentin several times for the last 20 years, I believe, or 15 years. Did you always know that you'd be a good fit with him before you started working with him when you saw his previous films? I didn't think I'd be a good fit even when I was with him. <laughs> uh, Quentin, and bit by bit, over Kill Bill and into uh, Inglorious, uh, we became closer and closer. And so now I do feel I fit well. <laughs> what about you, Jennifer? Was he someone you had always had your eye on wanting to work with? Oh, yes. I mean, since I saw Reservoir Dogs, I've been wanting to work with him. So that's that's quite a while now. A very long time. Yeah. What would you each say is unique about working with him? I and mean, you've worked extensively also, Bob, with Oliver Stone and Martin Scorsese. What's specific and special about working with Quentin as far as your job is concerned? Uh, his love of the word. Uh, I, he honors the word deeply, which makes for beautiful performances. His work with actors is phenomenal. And the degree of focus he has upon both that word and the acting is something he also puts into the way he moves a camera. How about yourself? He's unlike any director I've ever worked with. His enthusiasm, his like sheer joy. He loves filmmaking so much and he appreciates what everyone, he, he really demands the best and the most you have to give and, and he gets it and he appreciates everything that everyone brings. Um, and he just makes it fun. You just, you want to be on the set. How do each of you, how did each of you learn about all of the insane stuff that happens in this movie? Was, did he sit in a general meeting and tell you about, oh, so this is what I'm thinking, it's gonna be in 70 millimeter and you're gonna get vomited on and this is what's gonna happen? Or did you sit in a room and read it and learn that for the first time there? Um, well, a lot of it's in the script, but um, in the original script, my brother's head did not get blown off. So that I kind of found out maybe the day before it happened. <laughs> that was kind of a, a big, big one. <laughs> What's the one thing when you read the script for the first time that you thought, I can't believe that I'm going to do this? Was it blowing snot out your nose? No, that I just did because I happened to have snot in my nose. <laughs> and I thought I would just, you know, he wanted everything from Daisy just to come from inside. So if... You know, I felt it, I did it. Um, uh, yeah, no, um, what was the craziest thing? I mean, just the idea of being invited to being the only woman in this epic Western was kind of thrilling and extraordinary for me. Um, and then to be so embraced by the group. And uh, she's just, an. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible role. What did you guys want to do with the look of the film that maybe you hadn't done? in previous collaborations? Oh, well, principally it's the, the capability and the opportunity to shoot with 65 millimeter was rather unique. Uh, finding these old lenses was a remarkable uh, opportunity. And to work in what I felt was a heightened reality with uh, the use of color and uh, the beauty of the bronze. Can you, in layman's terms, explain what shooting on the format that you did adds to things, I mean, and then when I heard it was in that format, I thought it was just gonna be all kind of huge landscapes, but so much of it is more intimate close-ups. What did that all add to the equation? Well, I don't think format's vital to whether it was 16, 35, or 70 millimeter as much as 
what happened with the 70 millimeter is it brought the intimacy of the faces uh, much more alive. And I think you can read a performance like Jennifer is remarkable as well as everyone. It's to see their eyes is with that clarity and also all the, the mannerisms on such a large screen such as this or even larger as the Zig Field or wherever. It's quite astounding. Yeah. So the beauty of the format is literally that, the scale of the negative. So many times you hear actors say like with HD, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm gonna be shot in HD. Was there any part of you that went, oh God, what does this mean? It's gonna be in 70 millimeter. Or was that not something that went through um, your mind? Well, not when you have Bob shooting you. <laughs> you feel like you were in very good hands. I mean, I feel like there's scenes where, I mean, Quentin, I remember one day early on, I said to Heba, the makeup artist, there's only one kind of mascara I can use because my eyes, they'll bleed, It'll, the mascara always bleeds. And she said, oh no, you're not wearing mascara in this movie. <laughs> and that was the, the first time I realized, oh, okay, yeah. all right, I'm, I'm game. And then, you know, more and more blood and more blood and more blood and vomit and blood. And <laughs> Then I watched a daily and I was seeing myself covered in blood, but with Bob's lighting, I was like, gee, I look so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was never afraid because Bob was shooting me and Quentin was directing me, and so it was like a free fall that just felt so safe and so good. How often do they have to reapply? I mean, did it, did it get all cakey and then they had to kind of take... Oh, yeah. It's sticky as shit. I mean, <laughs> it's bad. It, so it was like always, but I was just so happy. So I didn't, mi you know, I was so thrilled to be a part of this movie. So I never minded any of it. But yeah, it's really, really, you can't move your fingers. They have to spray you down with water and then they have to put more blood on top of the water and, you know, things like that. From each of your perspectives, what would you each say was the best and the worst part about shooting in the snow? The cold. Was the best part? Was one of the worst parts. Okay. And the snow was one of the most beautiful parts. Mm. So it was a good and the bad. Good trade-off. What about for you? Um, the, the hardest part, I would say, was when we were outside trying to determine the wiser choice, to stay in the carriage or to stay in the snow or to walk the two football fields to the warming tent. Um, so I would often choose to conserve my energy <laughs> and stay in the snow or stay in the carriage. And I, I, I wouldn't recommend that if you're ever faced with that choice, like go, go to the warming tent. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've read an interview with you, Bob, where you said that I guess a lot of this was filmed in a studio here in California that was incredibly cold. Was that because there just wasn't the capability of making it warmer, or was that because Quentin wanted it to be really cold? Quentin wanted it very cold. He had numerous uh, refrigerator trucks lining the studio stage, which is Red Studio. It was initially intended that we would shoot only a third of the film on location, or maybe even less. And as we shot there and the weather didn't come in, we ended up shooting over half or approximately half of the film on, on a location that did, it was completely practical. So no walls move or anything for the shots. And some of these shots, as you can tell, needed uh, to move walls. And uh, then we moved to the stage and Quentin won breath. So it had to be at a certain level, oh, okay, right. which, was, which made it unbearable. Everybody would attempt to sabotage the, uh, the refrigeration system. Well, it occurred to me that you all could have said, you know, Quentin, we're professional actors. We can act like we're cold. You know, this wouldn't be that hard to do. You but can't then act breath. You're right, you can't act, can't breath. act breath. They can't put that in post-production? It looks like crap. <laughs> it really does. I mean, you can always, you know, when you're watching a movie and they CGI the breath, you're always distracted by it. You see, you're like, something's off in the scene. It just pulls you out of the movie. So, and Quentin just hates anything that's not real. Right. And Quentin tried to avoid all visual effects wherever possible in the movie. Um, his attempt is to do it all in camera. So... Even the finish of the film is done a digital intermediate. As you can see, it's, it's just straight. It's not scanning and putting it onto film. It's a chemical release. Right. So what you shoot on the set is what you are watching. We, we have no capability of repairing what we did, what I did. There's some great added sound, though. I mean, when you take the elbow in the face, there's a, that sound effect is so great. What, what was your reaction to... I mean, it must be one thing to shoot that, but then to see it in a huge screen and to see yourself being treated so violently with that heightened sound, it must be a very strange sensation. 
I mean, honestly, seeing myself on the poster is a strange sensation. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, what's great is that all the hits really work, and um, I never got hurt. I mean, Kurt never missed, and that's, that's saying a lot, because he hits me an awful lot in the movie. Speaking of Kurt, uh, when I interviewed the two of you together, I, I just remarked upon the fact that you're chained together through the whole movie and what you must learn about someone when you're chained to someone for that long a period of time. But now I, what I want to know is, at what kind of intervals were you able to unchain yourself just to have some away time? Um, you know, we could sometimes, um, I mean, whenever we finished a scene, we would get, you know, unlocked and... Um, yeah, when we, when we weren't shooting, we weren't locked. I mean, we, when we were shooting a scene, we usually stayed cuffed. Right. <laughs> Is there a, a particular shot or scene that you would tell people who are watching this, because this is being filmed, um, that, to, that you really love, a shot that you think is particularly cool or gorgeous? No, I don't have uh, any particular shot in mind. I did read something that you think the color red has a specific pop. Particularly the red in her face. Uh, all right. Yeah, does very well. It, she does look beautiful in the movie, in my opinion, too. <laughs> and you've seen this now several times where you think sometimes it's a beautiful, beautiful projection, other times not as great. What accounts for whether it really lives up to its full potential? The men in the booth. Nice. <laughs> I'm sure you all have questions for these two. What, what can I What can I? question is how many weeks the shoot took? I don't remember. I think it was like five months, but I'm not, but some of that might have been rehearsal. We started in November rehearsing and then we finished late May, I think. Right. Well, what is, how many months is that? I don't know. I think five or six. Okay. Hi. The question is how's Jennifer, how did Jennifer get cast and, and what the preparation was? Um, I was on a, sh I guess a sem somewhat short list of actresses that Quentin was interested in. He had, most of the roles he knew who he wanted to cast, but Daisy, he wasn't sure. And um, I got an email from my agent um, saying that I should pick up the script and I was gonna be reading at Quentin's house. So I did and there was, I had the whole script for two days before my audition, but I was missing the last chapter. Um, so Daisy doesn't talk a lot in the movie and so I read it several times and then I went to Quentin's house and we talked for a long time about Daisy and he wanted to know my thoughts about her and, and then he came in with the last chapter and he said, um, okay, why don't you read this? I'll give you some time and then we'll read from that. Um, and then I started reading it and Daisy suddenly speaks quite a lot and so that was a little daunting and I, you know, I was a little scared. But um, I just, I once had an acting teacher who said, think of an audition as a time you get to own that part. And it may be only be for that 10 minutes, but for that 10 minutes, it's yours. Mm. And I also love Quentin's movies so much. And I, all I had to lose was the part, you know? All I had to, I could, if I held back, it would be over. And I might as well have a great time. But what he did is he came in and he sat next to me and opened his script, and we just read together, which most directors don't read with you, they watch you, but he actually reads with you, and that's a good indicator of just what he's like as a person and as a director. You really felt like he was with you, and you were acting together, and it was play, and it was fun, and you suddenly felt, in a way, fearless. He just brings that out in everybody because he, you feel like his, it sounds corny, but you feel his love and his enthusiasm for what you do. Um, Did you feel good about it when you walked out of the room? You know what, when I walked out, I, my mom made me promise that I would call her, which I did. And she said, how did it go? And I said, I actually have no idea, but I had the time of my life. And it really, if it had stopped there, I would have just had such a great day. So the fact that I'm sitting here right now is really like, Thrilling. And then how does he let you know? Is it a phone call or is it through your representatives? Um, I got a call that he wanted to have dinner to discuss the role. And um, we did that. And then he told me basically he had like a few more people that he had to read and he had to read them, but that he was feeling very good about me in this part. Whoa. And then it was like another two weeks.
before I found out. And has it ever happened where you've heard that from a filmmaker and then you ended up not getting it, where you were kind of led on to believe that you would, but you didn't, or did you know at that point, this is a done deal for me? I didn't know, no, because someone can always come in and blow you out of the water, you know? So I didn't know, but um, I, I felt optimistic, but also very, um, what's that word where you're superstitious or trepidatious? Like I didn't want to think that I had it because I, I didn't. Thanks for the question. Who else? The question is about Quentin's uh, directorial methods. If he wants an adjustment in between takes, how does he go about making that known? And how many takes roughly do you do usually? Um, he has so many different, like brilliant ways. I mean, there's like the obvious way of uh, try it like this. And Kurt would say, it's gonna seem crazy sometimes, but just do it. <laughs> <laughs> like don't even think about it and you you really do know with him that you can just trust it and all you you know have to do is just you know give yourself over to it he demands that you like really know the lines backwards and forwards and no cell phones um, and um, and then there's other like really just subtle things like he lets you kind of find things behaviorally and he wants that and he wants it to come from you, and um, he really lets things kind of play out. Um, I'd say we do what uh, on average like four takes, maybe four, not very many. Any final questions? Hi. Question is whether she liked Daisy as a character. Yeah, I love her. Didn't you all love her? She's yes. an angel. <laughs> Did you notice the angel wings when she was hanging? There you go. Last question. Oh my gosh, yes. Question is about the differences between working in digital and in film. Uh, there's, there's a substantial amount of difference. The primary difference is, of course, the speed at which digital is working nowadays. So your lighting package can drop. Uh, I still think uh, there are very strong similarities in the need of both to, uh, for a film to come out well, and that's composition, lighting, and uh, et cetera. I think that they don't alter that much substantially once you're, uh, whether it's film or whether it's digital. I, you just have to get your hands on uh, the digital so that you can break it down a bit so it's not quite so uh, sports oriented we in some cases. A, we have time for a little more right here. The question is whether there were outright allusions to The Exorcist. Um, we didn't actually talk about The Exorcist, but there is one moment where I completely stole from that movie because I, it's, it actually is one of my favorite movies. Um, and it's after Reagan kills the priest, just because there's that feeling of having so much power but also being completely lost that Linda Blair was so... <laughs> She was so damn good in that. And, but you really felt that all that power and then just the mania of having got what you finally wanted, but now what do you do? You know, and, that, and just, uh, so yeah, I totally ripped that off. And then Quentin, of course, so it was like, I saw what you did. <laughs> he liked it, but he knew, he knew, exactly. Well, I think I speak on behalf of everyone. I say thank you for making us laugh and thank you for grossing us out with this movie. Congratulations on the Oscar nominations. Thank Robert you. Richardson and Jennifer Jason Lee. Have a great night. Now we're talking. <laughs>